My life has always been about stories. Um, I could read before I went to school. In the school summer holidays we had to prove to the librarian we'd read our books because we'd go back every second day. Um, I was brought up on stories, Bible stories. To me, these stories were true and I could see them. You know, when that trumpet sounded, I saw the walls of Jericho come down. I knew what it was like to be in the belly of a whale and I didn't see a whale until I was in my 30s in Rhode Island. But stories were the most vivid things that taught me the way to be. The story I want to talk about today is actually about my father. And to me, it's a story that has magic in it. And the first piece of magic was that growing up on the west coast of Scotland, we never got snow. We got snow to about here and then it turned to rain. Um, but one year we had perfect snow. I didn't see snow again like that till I went ski skiing many years later. And the other magical thing was that for some reason it was just my dad and me and I was probably seven or eight. And we went for a walk and the sky was the bluest blue you can imagine. And I know that it had to be Christmas because we were eating tangerines wrapped in foil, the pretty coloured foil. And in those days you only got them at Christmas. And that walk was magical in itself. But then my father said, I tell you what, we were looking at a field that nobody had walked on, pristine snow. And he said, let's see who can walk the straightest line to that gate over there. Oh, this was something I knew I could do that. I wanted to beat him because at seven or eight, you don't get to beat anybody, not your dad especially. And I worked hard and I put one foot in front of another very carefully and at that point I wanted to be a ballet dancer so you know I could place my feet. And we got finally to the gate and we turned around and looked back and his footsteps were straight as a die. And mine wiggled all over the place. And he said, you see the thing is when you want to get somewhere you keep your eyes on that. You don't bother with what's going on around your feet right now. You just look at where you're going and you aim for that. And that's always stayed with me. And the times are when I'm looking at my feet and I'm worrying about cash flow or downturns in the economy or stuff. And I just remember, what's my prize? What's the goal that I'm aiming for? What's the meaning in my life? And that makes me think of that stunning, magical day with my father. On the 9th of December 1905, the French Parliament voted on separating church and state. This was the conclusion of a discussion which has started at the beginning of the revolution in 1789, and a consequence is that religious education could no longer be taught in French schools. So, overnight, schools had lost their source of moral teaching. Um, thankfully, at hand were the fables of Jean de La Fontaine. De La Fontaine was a writer of the 17th century, uh, the golden age of French classical writing, uh, who had modernized the fables of Aesop. And uh, since then, since 1905, every French child up and down the land has had to learn a good bunch of fables. And if you ask people in the street, they will quote you immediately, immediately from a dozen fables. The top four, um, in terms of the most famous fables, are the hare and the tortoise, which is well known in the English language, uh, the chicada and the ant, which advocates thrift and, and hard work, uh, the wolf and the lamb, which is a reflection on power, but the most famous one, bar none, is the crow and the fox. Now, this story starts in the forest where you have a crow who is holding a large piece of cheese in his beak. And along comes the fox smelling the cheese and he thinks he'll have a piece of that. So he tells the crow that, uh, Mr. Crow, you have a great reputation as a fantastic singer. Actually, not only have I heard that you are a fantastic singer, but I have heard that you are the best singer of the whole forest. Flatter, the crow, of course, opens his mouth, starts singing, and the cheese drops on the ground. At this point, the sly fox picks up the cheese and says, well, uh, uh, Mr. Crow, uh, one thing that you need to know is that every flatterer's livelihood depends on the flattered. And this lesson is definitely worth a piece of cheese, don't you think? So there are two conclusions to this story. 
The first one is that in management, for example, there are plenty of people waiting to be flattered and probably an even bigger number of people waiting to flatter them. Uh, and the flattered person simply knows to think about the consequences in advance. The second interesting uh, conclusion of the story is that only in France could you have two animals fighting over a smelly piece of cheese. There you go. My story is a corporate tale. It's a corporate tale about a visionary leader, someone who's still talked about in that business today and is imbued in the culture of that business. I'll give you a clue. He's Victorian and he also set up one of the biggest companies in the world. So, William Lever was a entrepreneur, a soap maker, an MP, a social reformer, and he was also Lord of the Western Isles of Scotland. He was born in 1851, and by the time he was a teenager, he was working in his father's grocery business. By 1885, he'd actually set up a soap business along with his brother and also their friend, a chemist, William Watson. And together they perfected the manufacturing of a soap bar. A real soap bar, much like the soap bars we know today, which actually lathered properly and worked well. They called it Sunlight Soap. And that was the birth of one of the UK's iconic brands. By 1888, demand for this soap had increased so much that they had to move from their current premises. They moved out into the countryside, into the Wirral in Cheshire, and there they set up a, a soap works that they called Port Sunlight. Port Sunlight grew and grew, and at the same time, William Lever decided to set up and establish a workers' village. He built cottages for the workers, very nice houses today and highly sought after. Um, and he also set up community centres and churches and so on, for the workers, so they could actually live in very nice surroundings. At the same time, he set up the Lady Lever Gallery, which actually houses some of the great pre-Raphaelite paintings that we know and love today. It's still a tourist attraction. By 1904, he'd become an MP. And as a Liberal MP for the Wirral area, his maiden speech was urging the government to set up an old age pension something he already did for his workers at Port Sunlight. In a couple of years' time, he'd become a baronet, and he unusually chose to take his wife's maiden name in his title, so he became Lord Leverhulme. The business continued to expand. It expanded overseas, brought on new brands, and did incredibly well and became the modern multinational it is today. And the moral of this tale? Well, this is just all about visionary leadership. This is about a, a guy who built a business from a grocery shop. It's about a guy who made a real difference socially. And he was, at the end of the day, a forefather of modern marketing and the brand. What a guy. When I was a wee boy, we lived overseas. Libya, Nigeria and Australia, seemingly quite an exotic place to grow up, but the most romantic, distant and exotic place I can remember from that time was Scotland, really because of the stories that my dad told us when we were small, kind of romantic stories, stories about battles, stories about chieftain, the odd stealthy claymore. But probably the most important story he told us was a story of resilience. And it's a story about the clearances in Scotland, which were effectively the partition of the land by the landowners to make way for sheep. Sheep were more important than people because they needed them in the south for the wool and for the meat that the people who could buy the cloth would eat. My ancestors were actually burnt from their houses in the Highlands and marched to the edge of Scotland to a remote and windy place at the edge of Caithness, where they were left, basically, to fend for themselves. The challenge being, apart from the weather, the fact that the salt had seeped into the soil and nothing would grow. So, to feed your children, you did innovative things like 
eating puffins' eggs or seagulls' eggs, which you would climb the crags and cliffs to get after you tied your children to the rocks to stop them from blowing away. Well, obviously, this was not the kind of place you wanted to stay, so the positive spin my dad put on the story was really effectively this. You had a number of choices. You could look back over the hill, over the mountains to what you had lost, and weep. Or you could take to the sea and fish, learn to fish, which they'd never done. Or you could take to the sea and you could keep going, which is what they did. Most of my ancient relatives, often over Scotia and off to Australia, to a place that was as dry as the place they'd left was wet. So really the moral of the tale is this. I think whenever things in my own life have got really chewy or a bit too much to bear, I think about all the things my family have been through and their blood runs in my veins. Today I'm going to tell you the story about the jar and the philosophy professor. Once upon a time, a philosophy professor, at the beginning of his lesson, took an empty and large jar and started to fill it with big stones. Then he asked the students if the jar was full, and the students said, yes, the jar was full. Then the professor took a box of pebbles and started to pour them into the jar. Pebbles started to roll into the jar and fill the empty spaces between the stones. Then the professor asked again to students if the jar was full or not, and the students said yes, it was. Then the professor took a bag of sand and started to pour it into the jar. The sand started to fill all the gaps between the pebbles. Once again the professor asked the students if the jar was full or not, and the students said yes, now the jar is definitely full. Then the professor took two pints of beer and started to pour them into the jar. Students started to laugh, but the professor interrupted them and said, I want you to recognize this jar like your life. The big stones represent important things, your family, your children, your partner, your health. Even if everything else is missing, your life will be still full. The pebbles represent the things that matter, like your job, money, your house, your car. The sand represents all the small stuff. If you put the sand first in the jar, there will not be space for the pebbles and the stones. The same has to be in your life. If you spend too much time and energy on small stuff, you will have no time for the important things. You should set your priorities and understand what makes you happy. All the rest is just sand. One of the students raised his hand and asked the meaning of the beer. The professor said, I'm glad that you asked, because it doesn't matter how empty or full your life is. There will always be space for a couple of beer with friends. 